Hello, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Adam Downing, Extension Forester in the Northern District, and we're here again today at McCormick Farm, uh, also known as the Shandoah Valley Ag and Research Extension Center. We talked uh, some time ago about a project that we're starting here called a Femmelschlag, which is an expanding gap, uh, harvesting and silvicultural method to regenerate oak, we hope. And so the harvest is underway, and I'm excited to uh, be able to visit with the logger today and learn a little bit about his logging operation. So tell us about your, uh, your logging operation and describe kind of a day in life uh, of, of your operation. Uh, not a real big operation, just the three of us. That's me and my brother, and we got one other guy that helps us full time. Uh, we've got a couple truck drivers that haul some stuff to the mills for us, but mainly just the three of us. We kind of come to the woods every day, and everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody jumps in a piece of equipment, and we go at it. Okay, so let's talk about your equipment. Here behind us, we've got some of the equipment. Is this is our big loader? Uh, most 95% of the time, I'm on it. So it's called a loader, mm -hmm. but it's doing more than loading. You're I also, actually buff, saw up the logs, buck up all the wood, stuff like that, and okay. stockpile it, put them on the trucks. Okay. What's bucking? Uh, just cutting them in the lengths that they need to be to go to the mills. Okay. And that varies depending on the, what the mill is looking depending for? Depending on what they're looking for, what okay. species you're cutting, to what length you want to cut it to send it. Okay. Very good. So this is a loader. That's loading, and there's a, a truck load behind, partially loaded of, uh, is that pulpwood? Pulpwood, yeah. Going to Covington. Okay, and that would be rock. turned into... Paper, cardboard, I'm not sure what all they do with yeah. it out there. So. Okay. Where will the nice logs, uh, nice uh, salt timber logs go? Uh, right now we're hauling everything to Northwest, which okay. is, we. Have, their main mill is in Buena Vista, but we're dropping everything in Fairfield. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the other equipment. What we're not seeing here, but I'm hearing in the background running is? Uh, we've got a cutter, got a head on the front of it. Uh, got to be careful with some of the bigger stuff, but it can pretty well cut everything that's here. Okay. And so that cuts it and kind of lays it down? Picks it up. Uh, the smaller stuff he can carry around and kind of place in piles and put where he wants, but the bigger stuff, pretty much you cut and cut, let loose of it and let it go. Okay. And then the other piece of equipment running around out there? That's our skidder. Uh, it's a 648L. My brother runs it most of the time. And the grapple skidder has these big claws, essentially, that grab it versus a cable skidder that... Where you, don't, where you gotta get off and hook them up. Much yeah, right. easier. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they both have cables on them if you get in a spot okay. where you gotta pull some cables. So one thing uh, that's um, that's going on here in the Femmelschlag is some gaps. But then in between these gaps, we have some, some removal of some low-grade stuff, trying to leave some good stuff and create conditions to regenerate oak. So describe how that is for you guys operating with some of this large machinery. Well, as far as the clear cuts, that's pretty easy. You know, you can go in and make a hole and make yourself room to get the stuff in and out. As far as the thinning, in places where it's tight, it makes it tough to get the big equipment in and out. You got to be careful not to rub up against other trees and tear up other trees when you're when you're down when you're topping the other ones, so mm -hmm. when you're knocking them down. As far as knocking the tops out of the stuff that you're trying to leave, look, you got to be a little bit more careful as far as the cutting goes. Mm -hmm. um, operationally, is there anyone getting out of a piece of equipment? Is it mostly? Uh, on a job like this, we try not to get out very much. Yeah. We try not to actually even get a chainsaw out of the truck very often. Much safer and the production's way better yeah. okay. if we can all stay in a piece of equipment and stay moving. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, how timber is sold. In this case, the timber sale was marked by a forester and it was put together a prospectus, a, a list of you know what's here, what the acreage is, the species, the size, um, approximate uh, volume estimates. And then that was sent out to people who buy timber, timber buyers, loggers, and mills. And so, Eric, you were the successful bidder in this. Talk about some of the factors that uh, you consider when coming up with what you think you can offer and still make a profit yourself. Uh, I mean, we normally just come out and kind of cruise, walk through it. We don't cruise it quite as tight as probably what they did when they marked it, but we try to look at everything. and go from there and on this job we had to uh, consider that we had to, I think it was I'm not sure how many feet it was close to 5,000 feet maybe as far as we had to build a road gravel it stuff like that so yeah you take that into consideration you have to take that off of your lump sum bid to make sure you come back out and diesel's not cheap you got your diesel that you're using here as well as hauling it to mm -hmm. Covington and whatever yeah mills. I mean that's kind of a chance you take because it fluctuates so much yeah. sometimes when you bid a job diesel price may be at a decent price and then when you go to take off and start working it it may be a lot a lot higher so then there's also the value of your equipment you got to pay off pay loans probably um, how much equipment do you have sitting out here in terms of 
equity or right i mean we've got two or three trucks we've got a loader a buck saw a dozer two skidders and a cutter so you're looking at close to probably five hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and this is not brand new stuff and it's not new we can't afford the new stuff yeah <laughs> it's all used okay thank you eric yep thank you Silviculture is the technical definition, the art and science of sustainably managing a forest. So when we talk about the art and science, um, science of course is a little bit more self-explanatory. Rich history of research that's been done in forests um, that we can draw upon to help inform our decisions. Um, but we understand that we can't really cover all of the possible combinations of factors um, in our research that might appear in any given forest. So the art is sort of speaking to that intuition that a forester needs to develop. Um, so when they're dropped into a situation that they haven't encountered before or can't find in the literature, they kind of know how to manage that forest or push it in the direction they want it to go. So we have five classic silvicultural systems that we recognize. Um, the full spectrum of those silvicultural systems that are sort of the textbook um, five we have a clear cut, sea tree, shelter wood, group selection, single tree selection. And from clear cut to single tree selection, we're kind of covering um, the highest severity, meaning the largest percentage of trees removed in a clear cut, to the lowest severity or the fewest number of trees removed per acre in a single tree selection. And the reason we have this spectrum or this diversity of different silvicultural systems is because we have a diversity of different tree species we're trying to recruit and promote. Um, so what we're effectively managing in our natural stands is the amount of light that's reaching that forest floor. And that amount of light is going to largely determine what shows up and what dominates that stand post-harvest. For one reason or another, Gifford Pinchot and Carl Schenck started utilizing silviculture here in the United States. They only brought a handful, literal handful over, <laughs> um, from Europe and left some behind. One of those that they left behind is called uh, the Femmelschlag system, which is a German system, as most of our silvicultural systems are. And the loose uh, translation of Femmelschlag into um, Americanized silvicultural terminology is an expanding gap silvicultural system. To my knowledge, um, the person that popularized expanding gaps or exp Femmelschlag systems, those are synonymous, was my master's advisor, Bob Seymour, up at UMaine. So I had the good fortune of being exposed to one on the ground, um, in person. There's Now I can think of about five that exist in the U.S. Um, here on the screen I have an example of that Femmelschlag system or expanding gap system that we used in Maine. And this map this is an overview of one of the harvest areas and it's showing the original gaps in light blue, their subsequent expansions in this darker blue, and then we'd made a third entry or were planning for one by the time I left um, Maine. And that's this kind of speckled blue on the outside of this darker blue. So there will have been three entries since this was initiated back in 1994. These blue, light blue gaps that were original um, to the experiment have since been expanded and are now connected. And now we're adjoining additional gaps with these subsequent expansions. And what's kind of determining and guiding our way through this forest, all this white is unharvested, What's determining where we go next is basically where we have um, existing pockets of what we call advanced regeneration, which means seedlings and saplings that are already present. The extent of those seedlings and saplings determine how far we will expand these gaps in subsequent harvest entries. This black line here is our permanent road system that was installed at the time of the initiation of this harvest. And we've since continued to reuse this permanent road system every time we re-enter this stand. And what that prevents is logging equipment driving over top the regeneration we worked so hard to get. All right, so um, just a couple of days ago, Adam Downing and I, along with some other VDOF folks, were out in Rafine, Virginia, um, looking at an installation of a Femmelschlag. Virginia's first expanding gap Femmelschlag system. Um, incredibly exciting to have one put in on the ground. It was beautifully executed, um, and uh, so far so good. I like what I see. I'm Joe Rossetti. 
I'm the Hardwood Forest Habitat Initiative Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Forestry. The Hardwood Initiative is an effort by the Department of Forestry to do a better job of hardwood management in Virginia. So there's a lot of aspects to how we accomplish that in Virginia. Um, the first and foremost is with partners and working with partners such as Virginia Tech and our uh, partners at Extension. Today we're looking at uh, about a 50 acre stand of hardwoods uh, at McCormick Farm, a portion of which was harvested this winter as a demonstration of hardwood management. So all hardwoods aren't the same and there are lots and lots of hardwood species in Virginia. Um, oaks are a primary focus of the Department of Forestry in the Hardwood Initiative uh, because their regeneration is is, is kind of tricky and it's it's difficult to get dependably. Um, regenerating early succession trees like yellow poplar or red maple or sweet gum is much easier. What happens in our forest is the hardwood forests get converted to more shade tolerant species. If only a handful of trees get cut out every now and then, um, they get converted to hickory and black gum and, uh, and red maple. Um, and a few other species depending on where you are, uh, beech. Those species are not as merchantable as oak and uh, they don't all carry as many wildlife benefits as oak does. Not just the animals that eat the acorns, uh, but there's lots of insects that eat oak leaves that are the basis of the food chain for many species of wildlife. So while oak is a major focus of the hardwood initiative. That isn't it. That isn't the beginning and end of hardwoods. Uh, yellow poplar is a, a great tree also. It grows fast on really good sites and can produce a lot of volume and it's very profitable. And on some places might be able to manage poplar almost as fast as managing for pine. Okay, so let's take a look at, at this stump. Uh, this is a chestnut oak stump. You can tell it's an oak because the rings are super, super noticeable. They stand out really well. Uh, the, the lines in there, the early wood part of the ring and the, the dense big part in the middle in between the lines is the, the late wood part of the ring. Wood also gets lines in it going uh, this way from the middle of the stump to the edge. Those are called the wood rays and they're very prominent in oak also. So we can tell a lot from the growth rings in the stump. There's the pith, the very first growth ring. Uh, that's where the seed, uh, just below this is where the seed germinated. Then the tree grows one ring of wood every year, going the whole way out and uh, until you get to the bark. And if the tree uh, had not been cut and continued growing next year, it would have put down another ring of wood under the bark here and then just kept on going. Back here in the, the middle when the tree started growing, it was doing pretty well. Each ring is about a sixteenth of an inch, which since you get that on both sides of the tree means about an eighth inch of diameter growth each year. And that continues on until you get out to about here where the rings get a lot smaller. And that means this tree wasn't getting a whole lot of sunlight for many years. There's, there's probably 20 or 25 rings just in this space. Then there's a few good years right there. And then it tightens up again. When the, the rings tighten up, uh, that could be because of a few different things. If it's just one ring that's narrow, it's probably a single year event, like a, a drought or a, um, a defoliation by an insect. Uh, but a whole bunch of years of small growth like this means the stand was overstocked and there were too many trees or this was suppressed in the understory and it wasn't getting enough light. After several years here where this stand was probably in the stem exclusion stage, there was some other kind of harvest that happened here, or, or maybe it wasn't stem exclusion. Maybe this regenerated in an understory and got so far and then was suppressed by the overstory that was left around it. And then another harvest happened right here in this year, and the growth is considerably larger. Um, starting there and carrying all the way out. Whoop, there's one bad year. That's probably a drought year. And, but then it goes right back to nice big growth rings. So that means that that was just an anomaly. That was a one year event. And nice big growth rings all the way out here. Continue on all the way out here. And um, pretty good growth all the way until this was cut. It's getting hard to see through the sleet though. 